Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's artist conversation. I am Megan Rakepsel, the director of the Julio Fine Arts Gallery at Loyola University, and I am thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker for this evening's program. But first, just a few announcements. Please connect with the Julio Fine Arts Gallery on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We are at Julio Art Gallery across all of those platforms to keep up with all our programming announcements. Tonight, I join you from the gallery where we are hosting our final in-person exhibition for the year, Externalized, featuring three of our incredible Loyola senior studio arts majors. If you are a part of our Loyola community, please do stop by and see the work our students have created. And if not, please note that we will be creating a virtual version of the exhibition on our website, julioartgallery.com, so that everyone can have a, a chance to engage with this work. At that site, you can also learn lots more about the gallery's virtual and in-person programming. The gallery is supported in part by the Maryland State Arts Council. To discover more about the Maryland State Arts Council and how they impact Maryland, visit msac.org. Our program tonight is in the webinar format. And unfortunately, that means we cannot see your faces or hear your voices, but we still very much want to you to be a part of the conversation. Please feel free to submit your questions for our speaker throughout the program through the Q&A function. We will do our best to get to all the questions. Now for a little bit about our speaker, Massa R. Fard. Massa R. Fard often paints man-made large-scale structures such as cities, stadiums, and apparatuses. Growing up in Iran, she has always been conscious of the dominance of a rigid patriarchal gaze, both in the public and the private sphere. Accessing public and private domains as a female requires subversive strategies. Massa contemplates and practices these strategies in her paintings and writing through metaphors of censorship, sarcasm, camouflage, cover, and disguise. Massa has exhibited her work largely in Iran and the DMV, including two solo exhibitions recently, and has continued to find ways to show her work online throughout this pandemic, including the Women in the Arts online exhibition, hosted by Latella Curatorial X Artsy in Washington, DC. She graduated with an MFA from the Leroy E. Hofberger School of Painting at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore in 2019, where she was the recipient of several awards and has continued to live and work here in Baltimore ever since. Tonight's talk and artist presentation is the final event connected to the 2020-2021 Messina Common Text, Dear America, Notes of an Undocumented Citizen by Jose Antonio Vargas. Through Vargas's text, we experienced the power of words to describe the immigrant experience in America. Tonight, through her paintings, Massa Arfard will continue to forward our understanding of home and belonging. And now I will turn over the proverbial stage to you, Masa, to give us a short introduction to your work. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Megan, for the introduction. And thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, yeah, I'm Masa Fard, and I'm from Iran, and I was born in Iran and grew up in Iran. Um, if I want to start to talk about myself, I think I'm going to start to show my um, some slides as well. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, so yes, uh, I was born in Tehran. Iran and almost my whole life I lived there and um, one thing that I should mention is when I was born it was war between Iran and Iraq and I was so young at that time so I don't remember any specific thing about the war but I grew up in a country after war and um, I started painting um, when I was four years old and I, then I continue 
until when I was 15, 16, I went to art school. And after that, I had my undergrad back in Tehran, which um, today I'm gonna show only a couple of my works from back then, from undergrad. And um, most of my works, uh, the medium that I'm using, it's acrylic. And these are some of the works that I had back at a school. And also, yeah, as I mentioned that when I was born, it was war between Iran and Iraq. So war is something that always I'm um, thinking about it. And especially during my undergrad, it was a subject that I was working. And then to the time it changed and these are from all the app from back in Iran until 2017. 2017, this is almost, I think my last painting that I painted back in Iran, I completed. And then I left Iran and came to United States for the first time in 2017 for my grad school. And this is my first painting in Baltimore that I work. And something that maybe I should mention now, it's when I came to United States, it was my first time here. So I had so much challenge um, since I arrived here. And also I was able to come here right after travel ban. And I kind of, I think I was the first group of students that was able to come to United States after travel ban. And this is my second painting here in Baltimore. So during the time in my grad school, especially the beginning of it, I was um, always, I was still, you know, thinking about Iran, the subject that I was working there and at the same time, I had my challenges here that, you know, when I came here, I didn't have bank account, I didn't even have phone. So I had to um, kind of um, do all of those stuff. And at the same time, I had to be so fast and paint every day because Hofberger is a program that you need to be uh, kind of, we, we, we need to, be, to have, almost every week new paintings, working. So it was a quite challenge for me. But at the same time, uh, I was following news, especially news from back in Iran. And for example, this painting is one of them that um, it was during that time that one oil tanker, which belong it was belonged to Iran, uh, had an accident and 33 people they killed in that accident. So I, my reaction was just like, I started to paint about that. And the, from the image that I found on the internet. And most of my paintings, um, the processes I'm finding uh, images on the internet or social media. And um, it's uh, like when I'm thinking about a subject, or something that I want to paint, I start to search and then finding the images that I um, feel like I can work on it. But during my painting pro process, I change that image in a way that you might not um, be able to see the original, that much of original image anymore. These are, um, this one is from my one of my series explosion that I started, which it's kind of in connection with the war uh, series that I was um, working on the, back in Iran and during my undergrad. But yeah, it changed to explosion series. This one is the same as the previous one.
And then here is my stadium series. As you mentioned, Megan, I um, started this series, which kind of the, fair, the beginning of the idea was back in Iran. In Iran, women cannot go to a stadium. And um, so it was something always, I was thinking about it and I was questioning why I cannot go to a stadium because of my gender, because I'm a woman, so I cannot go to a public place. However, they call it public place. So I started the whole series here in the United States based on that idea. And then it's growing up about, you know, going more about pri private spaces versus public spaces. And, and these are all the stadium series. All, all of them are uh, images from one specific stadium in Iran, which is the biggest one in Tehran. And it's called Azadi Stadium and Azadi means in the word Azadi means freedom. And here it's one of my recent paintings from 2020. And this one is the first kind of painting from my um, refugee series, which I started and well, I can talk more about it later. But these couple of images are from my series, Refugees. This is, um, this is my last painting. The most recent painting, not my last painting, <laughs> the most recent one that I've worked, <laughs> um, that I finished there. Yeah, this one. And this one, I just only put a couple of these um, watercolor paintings that I'm doing now, which um, I have the whole series of um, women with hijab. And most of them, there are drawings, pencil and paper, old papers that I found back in Tehran. And we, which some of them are going back to their 40 years, 30 years old papers and I'm working on them. But uh, here I put uh, some of the one that I work with watercolor. And yeah, this is yeah, one, one shot of my painting. Great. Thank you so much for that um, introduction. And I am sure that a lot of the a, a lot of these works will come back up when we are talking. Um, uh, first question I wanted to ask is, is that, you know, this conversation is a common text event, as we mentioned in the intro for for Messina, our first year experience here uh, program here at Loyola, which means that um, we should spend some time thinking about the parallels between your work and the text, Dear America. Um, but before we get there, I wondered what your main takeaways, you know, as a human are from the book and, um, you know, just what did, what did you think about it? Well, I, yeah, I read the whole book and it was so interesting. And it was interesting because we, the way that we came to United States and our experience was so different, but at the same time, we had some stuff in common. And while he was talking about it, doing the you know book about his experience, and I was just like, oh yeah, I had that experience. I can feel you. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And which was so interesting. And for example, one part uh, when he was talking about how his friends, they helped him. I constantly thinking of my friends here, which they helped me a lot and they support me in any way they, they could, not even financially, financially and both in emotionally, everything. So, because I don't uh, even have 
my family here, my you know parents, my sister. And when I came here, it was only me. <laughs> and then I found so many great friends, <laughs> which they helped me a lot. And um, yeah, while I was reading it and some questions that Jose was asking during the book, I was just going back to those questions, thinking about it. And I could, yeah, feel the whole experience that we have here. Mm -hmm. So um, you are not undocumented as, as Jose Vargas, but you are in a sort of limbo with respect to the immigration process. Can you tell us a little bit about that and about your experience of being in this in-between space and how that has affected your work? Yes, um, so it's been now almost a year that I started the process for my visa and I applied for visa and I still am waiting on it. And it's a, every day. So I'm just waking up with this idea that, okay, what's going to happen? Am I going to receive anything today? And sometimes it's getting so far. It, I'm waiting so long that I don't remember anymore that I'm waiting for what? <laughs> But sometimes I'm thinking over and over and for both things that happen might happen. What should I do if they don't accept my visa? They reject me. And what should I do if they accept it actually? I even don't know what's gonna happen waiting this long. And so during the time that I'm waiting, I cannot work. And um, which make it so hard to live. And so you have that you know, pressure every day and you can feel that every day in your life. And at the same time, you push yourself to pain, to work, to fight for what you like, to fight for what you came here for. And it has impact on my work. It makes me to think actually and go back to, so, yeah, to all of the work that I did in the past. And for sure in future, it's gonna even, um, it, it's gonna show up more in my future works because now I have this experience living in limbo, not, I'm not sure about anything now. Yeah, that makes sense. So we have um, one question already, which I think might be an um, interesting question to ask now. Um, and that is, could you discuss how and why your use of color in your paintings has changed between your earlier paintings and your most your more recent work? And I don't know if it's connected at all to your status or having come here to, to do grad school or if there's, is there some, um, reason in your life or some sort of influence artistically that has changed that focus? Yeah, for the beginning of my graduate school, I could tell that my color in my painting changed a lot, which, um, well, at the beginning of it, I didn't have any image because I don't have that much photos from those works that I did from the beginning of my graduate school, which I had some weird landscape with really weird color combination and part of it because well the the time that i came here for a couple of weeks i was jet lagged mm -hmm. i couldn't sleep at, at all and i was working at the studio until late and until morning and i was seeing the sunrise and i don't know somehow when i was in tehran especially the um the time that i was before that so I wasn't looking at nature, sky that much. In Tehran, it's kind of always polluted. So it doesn't have a clear sky. So here in Baltimore, when I was seeing those colors at sunset, sunrise, and everything, that had actually a huge impact on my palette <laughs> at that time. And then um, what part of it, uh, it's something that I'm doing it um, 
on purpose. And for example, for the series that I showed, the explosions, it was just because based on what I, uh, the process that I was doing, which I was at that point for, for example, for this one, I was thinking about, so back at art school when I was 15, 16, I had spent so much time in dark room and I was, uh, I was developing photos and always looking at it. And it was um, the, the time that photo was developed, you know, coming out and part of it has more details, part of it didn't have. So yeah, based on what I was doing, I changed my colors and mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so now thinking about some of the main themes of the, of the book, um, belonging, home, connection, what are some of the ways your you think your work connects to these themes? And and as an artist, what as an artist, what thoughts did you have as you read through the book? Yeah. Um, well, first about home that you said. It's now it's getting more. I don't know what should I say because nowadays, when someone asking something that it has a word home, I have to ask that which home? You, you've been home back in Iran or here? <laughs> so it's, I cannot for sure say, I don't know which of them is my home now. Because, and each time that I'm talking, if I'm using the word home, I'm in my mind, I repeat it, home. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about it okay, where should I call home? And, but for sure, you know, my family is still in Iran. I have uh, still some stuff back in Iran, which for simple things, objects, I don't remember some of them anymore after three years not going back home. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes my sister or my mom or my parents, they call me and reminding me, oh, you have this, do you remember? And I'm just like, Oh no, I forgot about it. <laughs> but one thing that it was interesting for me when I was reading the book, um, the part that I think it was outlaw. That was about talking about one rule in journalism, which write the story, don't be the story. It was so interesting. And what he was doing was he was the story at that time. And I was thinking this is something I, think artists do without, you know, worrying about it. They're, sometimes they are the story of their work. It's not like journalism. But what I was thinking about my work and compare it to what I was reading was at the beginning, for example, the oil tanker that I show you, mm -hmm. I was trying to be journalist. I was trying to, so the story happened in Iran and I was trying to talk about that story instead of sharing my story. And now these days after, you know, after all of the stuff that happened while I'm waiting here and thinking about all of these connections about home belonging, I'm kind of more and more getting to that point that it's time that I, think and I'm being more the story mm -hmm. that you know it's interesting that you you bring that up because when you were talking about the um the oil tanker painting I was thinking about you know in conversations we've had in the past we've talked a lot about connection um and I was thinking and wondering if the, the fact of painting things that are happening in Iran while you're here was just sort of a way of you processing your connection to Iran and, and, um, and or even just trying to strengthen that connection in some way. Um, and I wasn't sure if, if you had thought about that or if that kind of factored into it. Yeah, it's, no, it's kind of, it, it was something that I was thinking about it, but it was, at the beginning was even more, I, it was 
not that long that I came here, but at the same time, I don't know why I was trying to keep my connection. And I was reading stories, news every day about Iran and whatever was happening, I was trying to bring it somehow in my painting. And I remember at that time, actually, it's so interesting. I remember I was just like, I want to be like a reporter. I want to, whatever happened there, I want to have it in my painting and talk about it in my painting. Which that process kind of, is, it's still there, but it's, it's for sure, especially in future, going to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when we when I first came to your studio and I was looking at this is pre pandemic, of course, and I was looking at your stadium pictures and thinking like, wow, do you ever paint Baltimore stadiums or Baltimore public spaces? And you were like, no, yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like this very like strong desire to continue that connection and that reporting and, and to, to be a, somehow part of Iran in, in that small way. Yeah. Yeah, especially well for a stadium, it's something that I don't know. The all of them are from one stadium, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. the biggest stadium in Iran, in Tehran, and in Iran actually. And yeah, it's still yeah. <laughs> um. So I, I wanted to shift a little bit to the, this series and some of your other work um, and, and ask you that, you know, a lot of your work has centered around the very fact of being a woman existing in public space and private space to some extent. And I'm thinking about this stadium series, but much of, much of your other work as well. Um, but a lot of that thinking is tied, to, as we've been talking about, to your experiences in Iran. So how has being in the U.S. shifted your viewpoint around being a woman in these spaces? So, yeah, it's a different experience because um, in Iran, you're, um, I know here you have your private space and then going to public space, but even you feel it more, I think, back in Iran because as a woman, I have, to have hijab when I'm going outside. So I need to just, and when you have that hijab, you, you kind of unconsciously, or I don't know, however, you, you, you have to act in a certain way, which that separates a lot between your spaces, being in your private space and being outside of that. And, um, I don't know, change a lot because also always I had, I, because it's something why it's not my choice for me. I had it by force. So there was time that even when I was going to nature or something, I didn't like it. I didn't want it. I felt so separated and here, now after, yeah, sometimes I still I'm thinking about it. When I'm going outside, I'm just like, do I need anything more? <laughs> or am I fine now going out like here? And also as a woman, there are some other stuff as well that um, uh, it changed. For example, there, um, I don't know how to explain it. For example, nowadays, um, the hashtag me too, Mm -hmm. it happened in Iran it's uh, later you know in the United States happened in three years ago I think and it was um, last year that it started in Iran in art community so it's getting so interesting for me because when that happened I had this chance to talk about it with my friends especially women here in the United States because they they have, you know, they had that experience. They had, um, you know, it was it's it's it wasn't something new for them. So it's kind of so interesting that I can share with them and talk about it with them because I'm so confused. There's still some news coming out, and I don't know how should I react to it. 
So I must start to talk about, for example, with my friends, my roommates and share it with them and they're talking about it. And yeah, it's a really interesting. <laughs> Do you think those conversations would not be able to happen in the same way in Iran or how, how do you think? No, for sure it happened in Iran. And for sure, I, if I, especially yeah, when I was in Iran, for sure uh, I could have it with my friends, but it was kind of all of us, for sure, it's, it's something new for us. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, um, because I'm talking, I'm talking about it with my sister, and sometimes she's confused as well. And then if I'm talking about it with some, someone here, I can share it with my sister as well, and mm -hmm. talk through it, and then finding other, you know, searching for it more, and yeah, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to the the concept of um, putting on a, a hijab in public and that not being your choice. And so how that how does that affect your identity or your feeling of identity? It's um, I don't know, it's something that I grew up with it and I always thinking about it. You know, I always thinking that, especially back in Iran when I had, okay, when I was going to these public places and for example, not being able to go to a stadium, there's so many questions you're asking everywhere. That's which most of them is why. <laughs> Started with why. That's why should I, you know, do this, why I cannot go there, why, yeah, there's, there's yeah. Um, I think at one point you had described it as like almost having two identities, you know, you feeling like a different person. Yes, exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, because you need, when you have that hijab and everything, and then you're aware of, you know, it's it's different. You you have to act in a certain way, so it makes you feel more apart from what exactly you are, what exactly who you are. And sometimes, yeah, I had this feeling in public places that this is not me. <laughs> yeah, I wanna, you know, if it was me, I was just wanted to go there or doing that, but I cannot do it. So it's not me. Who is that person in public? <laughs> and, and do you feel more like yourself here in the US or? Yes, however you, because I, I keep the whole stuff that happening after you immigrate to some other places, change a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so somehow I need a skill to process. Mm -hmm. who, who exactly I am and part of it that I came here this far from my family friends one 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 of the reason was grad school but the main reason was I wanted to see who am I without my family without my friends and without all of those rules for women back in Iran and everything so yes Um, we just to quickly, we have a question that came in, uh, which is, have you ever thought about trying to get your family or sister, especially into the United States? Well, if I want it, I can't now because I don't have a visa, but I had this conversation with my sister, actually, and I was just like, her name is Mona. And I was just like, Mona, what are you going to do? Do you want to come here or do you think you might? want to have you know study something and she said no <laughs> until now she's just like no i i want to stay here i want to do something here and yeah my family kind of is still my mom especially it's it's so interesting because um one thing that i have to mention the last that was the same talking about in his book when his mom 
saying it's time to, maybe it's time to come back home. I had the exact conversation with my mom. Especially this time that I'm waiting this long, she, she was just like, maybe it's time to come back home. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ask yourself, where is that when she said that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're asking this question. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I didn't do anything to do that yet. <laughs> um so I wanted to go back to your your work your newest work um cogitate is that how you cogitate <laughs> cogitate um and uh, some of that, and some of your other work as well is centered around the, the imagery of pools, um, especially that, that first work that you showed us from um, Baltimore. Yes. It was the first work or one of the first. Yeah, the second, um, yeah, actually the second work. <laughs> the second work. Um, so what do pools mean to you? What does that imagery mean? It's so interesting that I, um, I started to paint this empty pool, which I started back in Iran, and then I continued here. But it wasn't something that I call it series or doing it um, back to back or anything. One thing that I noticed each time something big was happening in my life, or I was in between something, I, I painted one of these empty pools. And it has different meanings and it's coming from different stuff, which um, one of them, one thing that I'm thinking is just for me, empty pools, just like those wishes that they never came through, you have and they never came through. And for those, I don't know, those moments that you have feelings that you're just, or you don't have any feelings or I don't know, something big happening, but you don't know how to <laughs> react to it. Or so I noticed that which I had exactly these empty pools right before I'm coming here. I had it when I came here. And the last one that I showed, it happened right before it happened recently. Um, so during this time, the pandemic time, I had this chance to work in two of my good friends, um, Kaylee Bartel and Luke Farley, which both of them are artists and my classmates, they were my classmates. And so I could, I was able to work at their studio. And, um, this painting is the last painting that I made in the studio. <laughs> and for me, again, it was something, it was going to change again. So again, I painted pools. Mm -hmm. But this time it's, it's not empty. <laughs> because it has water in it or? It has kind of reflection. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask if the other ones did have water in them. No, I'm <laughs> um, that's interesting. Um, can you tell us a little bit? Of, I mean, we have had a discussion, but I would love for you to tell everyone a, a little bit more about um, pools in Iran and, and how um, restrictions around them sort of um, play into your decision to use this as, as the imagery of like, um, wishes or dreams that never came true or, you know, things that you have to process that you don't really know how to react to. Yeah. So pools in Iran, it just, just like private and public places that I um, talk about, pools are for sure, they're separate for women and men. And um, so if we talk about public pools, you need to ask um, it's for women or it's for men. Or there are some places that they have completely separate pools for them, but there are some places they have separate time. And the interesting part, it's when it's one big um, build, one building has it, 
and they have this thing that they separated again. It's kind of those moments I'm thinking, okay, people are living there. It's kind of their private place, but they have this law and they respect the law and separate the time and everything. Even between family, they have to go at different times. And it's, yeah, always I'm thinking about that. It's again, going back to public, private. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd love to um, move on and talk a little bit more about the refugees series, um, since we didn't get much a chance to um, talk about it in your intro. Um, I just want to know, it, could you tell us a little bit more about them um, and about some of the ways these paintings have become more complicated for you as you've gone through the process of applying for an artist visa and um, the just working with immigration. Yeah, so uh, this one is kind of the first painting of that series, and which the I found the image. It's one of the painting that I found the image not on the internet. It was in I think National Geographic magazine that I found it. But the thing is, uh, in twenty seventeen, especially when I came here. It was all of the news about refugees, especially Syrian. And back in Iran, I was following the news and um, it was, it, it had a huge impact on me. And then when I came here, I was still thinking about it. So when I saw this image, which actually this image, the people sitting in the boat was um, from, they were, tourists they were going to see an island or something but they had all these yellow thing which you're wearing it when you're in the boat and as soon as i saw the image i thought they're so from, it's it's from the back they're so similar to those images of refugees in the boats they're sitting but these two group of people although they look same at the from the back and everything, but they having different destination. One of them, they're, they know kind of where they are going. In one group, they even don't know where they are gonna end up. So with this, all of these ideas and everything, I started this series. So this is the first one. And then until last year, I started working again on a couple of paintings of refugees. But one thing that it changed after this one year that I waited, I stopped. I put pause on this series because I don't know, it's, it's more than that, more than I, I knew it, it's a, I don't know, it's more than what I was thinking. And I feel like I had to stop, I had to pause and process it. And I don't know, because for sometimes, especially when I was at the school, so I could say, okay, I'm a student here, this, 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 and I can work from it. But now I kind of, maybe I, I feel more that I'm an immigrant now. <laughs> especially after four years and three years, I wasn't able to go back home in Iran. I, yeah, I stopped working on this series for now. And part of it maybe be going back to that, that I said, write the story, don't read the story. I'm thinking about maybe it's time I'm being the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's almost like um, you're you're living out this sort of questioning and um, the 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 idea of sort of being in limbo and and these figures are as well and that's almost too raw or too sort of complicated to be able to fully um, parse it in a painting or something. Yeah. 
I think this this one in particular is an, an interesting example because this was the main image in your solo show, your online solo show. Is that right? Yeah, this one I had. So I had, yeah, a solo show with um, this painting, which I started to take photo from the process and everything. And then, yeah, I had an online show which uh, my friend Josh Sander, he helped me. And yeah, and I, I start, uh, I was working on this series at the beginning of pandemic, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just thought it was, this is an interesting example because um, especially at the beginning, you were talking about how you take these images, you know, from the internet or from wherever you find them, but through the process of painting them, the original becomes obscured, it becomes changed, it becomes um, something else entirely. And that whole exhibition was really about sort of the, um, the ways that this painting evolved over time. And it was um, a dream, the dream stimulation was like that you could sort of change the painting as a viewer, you could sort of click a few buttons and get different um, iterations of it in some way. Am I, is that right? Yeah, 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 the AI. <laughs> <laughs> so for that, so the whole show was based on two paintings, which there exist in real life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the rest of it is from the process. Yeah, the image that I took from the process. And yeah, my friend Josh, uh, he, um, the AI um, producing, I think more than, I don't remember the exact number, but yeah, each time you're clicking, you're gonna have it. Right. <laughs> um, we have a question that is um, about the uh, painting hallucination. And, and the question is, what, what is the hallucination in this painting? Um, it's interesting. <laughs> I don't know the whole. The whole thing, the, the destination that they don't know where they're going and the, when, where they're going to end up. And because when you're watching news and reading about it. Most of them you're saying that, okay, they saved this much of refugees, but you don't know what's gonna happen next, where they're gonna end up. Are they gonna send them back or are they gonna go somewhere else or are they gonna stuck in some place that they even worse than where they were? Mm -hmm. And yeah, this thing, yeah, I was, yeah. Um, how has the pandemic changed your artistic practice? Well, um, for my the artistic practice, well, part of it because last year in March, before even I my visa ended, I lost my job. So since then, I basically living based on selling cars, which actually I can't say it changes in a way that now I can say maybe I'm a full-time artist. <laughs> <laughs> but for, I don't know, if we wanna talk about that, how it might show up in my work or anything, it's, it might happen in future. It's a still, I don't know. If mm -hmm. I can't say a, a specific, though, we can, you know, happen in the way. Mm -hmm. But for sure, yeah, change all of us life. <laughs> um, so I, I'm wondering what advice or thoughts you have for others who might be in various stages of the immigration process, you know, documented, undocumented, um, in the process of applying for things, you know, 
what what have you learned about yourself and about going through this that you can um, you can impart to others? Well, one thing that I'm thinking is, well, I was thinking when for me it was like that. I was thinking maybe it's the same from other people. When you're immigrating somewhere else, going somewhere else as an immigrant, there were some questions that you were asking yourself in life. And kind of for me, it was like that. And you're going to that place, maybe finding those answers. But then you're going to face more questions. There. It's not the end. It's not something that you're going there. OK, I'm finding the answers. OK, now I can do this, that. You face more problems, more challenges. And you need to be prepared. You need to be strong <laughs> because it's not easy at all. And there are some moments that actually when you're, I don't know, in other place without your family or friends, or you know, even when you're going out, people not speaking in your language, you need to switch it the way you're thinking about everything you face yourself actually more and sometimes that is scary <laughs> mm -hmm. and um yeah during especially after my graduation the whole experience of everything that I had and make me be more aware of my myself and my side that the, the weakness and or a strong part of me which those are stuff kind of exciting well, at the same time, yeah, you need to be strong and you, you, you have to handle it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but, yeah. But I cannot even imagine someone like being undocumented because me, even me, I'm undocumented. But it's so, I have so much challenge. And sometimes I feel like, is it on purpose? They put this much <laughs> obstacle in your way. So maybe, maybe one part you're saying, okay, I give up, I, I'm gonna go back. <laughs> um, I want you to like, I, I remember when we, when we talked, I. I was really struck by what you said about about how you felt um, about your privacy and independence after having turned over your documents. I wonder if you could share that with everyone as well. Oh yeah. Um, so well, after yeah, because they they need to know everything <laughs> basically. <laughs> And at some point when I was giving, when I was providing the documents for the visa, I felt like I don't have any more privacy. Since I left Iran and I, I, I basically gave them my whole life <laughs> because even they asked for the documents back at, you know, going back, 15 years ago or something that I started and everything. And you're becoming more, I don't know, I became more aware that I don't have actual privacy. I, I'm not, it's not a good feeling. Mm -hmm. You feel like someone watching you. And you have to be honest in a way that you don't feel good. <laughs> 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 Right, but then taking that and juxtaposing that idea of uh, this sort of like loss of privacy, loss of self in a way, but at the same time, you achieved something so huge that you didn't, you didn't know you had in you, right? So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, and also I remember when I, um, the day that um, it was one month ago,
go that for the second time, um, my lawyer hand in, they sent all of the documents. And that day when they told me, I was just sitting on the ground. <laughs> and it was kind of, I don't know, I, was got, I got so emotional. I was just like, no matter what happened, I did it. <laughs> it's so hard. <laughs> It was so emotional. Mm -hmm. It's very emotional. Um, I think I don't. If anyone else has any questions, now would be a really great time. Otherwise, um, is there anything else you wanted to add? That anything that you you really wanted to talk more about in your work, particularly? Um. No, I think I said most of it. And I'm kind of looking forward to the future. Although sometimes I'm, I overthink about it. Mm -hmm. And I know that. And because of the situation that I'm living, I have, you know, as I mentioned, I'm just saying, okay, what if this happened? What should I do if this happened? But at the end, I know that I'm gonna keep going and I'm gonna, Gonna stay strong. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you will too. Um, and I just want to really thank you so much for a really wonderful conversation. And I would like to thank Messina also for co-hosting the event with us and um, and for the the choice of the common text, which uh, allowed me to bring you in in this context. Um, and I. I just really thank you so much for sharing your story with us and your artwork. And uh, I hope that for our sake that you can continue here and, and continue to, to paint these um, striking images that we can see. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Megan, for having me. Thank you for your time and thank everyone for their time <laughs> in listening to me. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.